Thank you very much, Bruce. And thanks everybody for uh, being here today. As Bruce mentioned, this is some research that uh, he and I are conducting. It's funded by the Tamer Center. And we're doing this in conjunction with a group of Columbia Business School students. It's very much work in progress and I'm announcing some sort of preliminary tentative conclusions that we're, we seem to be moving towards, but there's certainly no, no final conclusions. The, um, so the aim of the research is essentially to evaluate uh, the significance of all of the various pledges <coughs> that have been made by the corporate world uh, concerning reductions in emissions. So we've heard from Occidental, for example, that they're planning to go carbon neutral by 2050. We've heard from Microsoft that they plan to go carbon negative by 2050. Uh, Alphabet and a whole bunch of other companies have all made similar pledges. Um, so what we're trying to do is essentially to evaluate these pledges and see whether taken together, <clears throat> they amount to something which is really significant or not. So you know, <clears throat> if these pledges are actually executed, and there's a big if there, so if they're actually executed, uh, do they amount to a 5% a reduction in US emissions or do they amount to a 50% reduction in US emissions? So the way we're doing this is we're documenting the pledges of all S&P 500 companies. So we're, we're, we're putting up together a database which says you know, exactly what did they pledge. Um, I just where actually started with when they pledged, made a pledge, but then the question is what did they pledge? Did they pledge to be carbon zero? Did they pledge to be carbon net zero? Did they pledge to be carbon neutral? And those are all incidentally different things and I'll talk about the differences in a second. Um, did they pledge a 50% reduction? In which case the reduction from what? Uh, and when did they make these? When are these pledges to be effective? Then we're going to talk about whether they pledged to make reductions in scope one emissions, or scope two emissions, or scope three, or all of them. And I'll explain again the difference between these in a second. Uh, we're looking at whether they have intermediate goals and whether they have an implementation plan. And these last two bullet points are actually quite important there, because it's just a, a, a blank, bland statement that we will be carbon neutral by 2050 without any details on how to get there, without any intermediate goals, is probably something we can be mildly skeptical about. Uh, whereas if you have a, a detailed implementation plan saying we will be carbon, carbon zero by 2050 and by 2030 we'll be here and by 2040 we'll be there and this is how we're gonna do this, uh, then I think we can have much more confidence in the, in the, the reality of a plan like that. So um, preliminary conclusions are that um, there's some major problems with the way we're accounting for carbon emissions in this area. There are also some major problems with the use of offsets. And I'll spend the rest of the talk really explaining what those two issues are. So this is the um, distinction between scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Um, scope one emissions from a company are emissions by that, generated by that firm's own activities. So if a company buys fossil fuels and burns them, then that generates scope one emissions. If it carries out a chemical reaction of some sort, and that chemical reaction leads to the emission of methane, then that's a scope one emission for that company. So scope one emissions are what you really obviously think of as a company's emissions. The, company's, the emissions of that company actually generates on its premises by its own activities. Scope two emissions uh, and scope three emissions are both what we might call indirect emissions. Uh, scope two emissions are emissions generated in the production of the electricity that the firm buys in. So if you buy electricity and electricity is produced by burning coal, then the emissions uh, from the coal burning count as your scope two emissions. Or if you buy, buy electricity produced by burning gas, again, the emissions from the burning of gas by whoever is producing that electricity count as your scope two emissions. And scope three emissions are any other emissions in the supply chain. Any other emissions generated by making the components that you use or the inputs that you use, or any other emissions generated in the use of your products, okay? So companies generally specify in their pledges whether they're going to reduce scope one emissions or scope two emissions or scope three or, or all of them. Uh, and probably the most common aim is to reduce all emissions, all of them, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Now, as soon as I list these definitions here, anybody with an accounting background is going to be saying, oh my God, double counting. And that's the, that's the real problem that we encounter with this way of approaching things. So if we take Columbia University, for example, Columbia University's scope two emissions, those are the emissions that come that are associated with the generation of electricity that we buy. So Columbia's scope two emissions are our power producers scope one emissions. And it's quite clear. So it means if our power producer, for example, switches from coal to renewable energy, um, then it cuts back its scope one emissions 
but it also cuts back our scope two emissions. So if you look at the resulting drop in emissions, there's a drop in their scope one emissions, and a drop in our scope two emissions, and we're double counting that drop in emissions. So what we actually see in the figures is twice the drop that actually occurred. And now if we, look, we, we heard from Occidental Petroleum earlier on, so Occidental scope three emissions come largely from the combustion of its gasoline. So you know, Occidental produces gasoline that goes to end users, they burn it in their vehicles, and that's the principal source of their scope three emissions. But the, the scope three emissions there also count as scope three emissions for the people who made the vehicles. For example, suppose that most of the vehicles are made by General Motors. Uh, then General Motors scope three emissions are the uh, <clears throat> emissions that come from the use of its vehicles. And the way General Motors vehicles generate emissions is by burning gas gasoline, and in particular some gasoline from, from Occidental. So there's going to be some emissions here which count both as Occidental's emissions and as General Motors emissions. Uh, and indeed, they won't only count as General Motors emissions, they'll count as Dunlop's emissions if they're using Dunlop tires, and they'll count as steel producers' emissions if presuming that the cars are made of steel, and so on. Um, so we got, again, we, if, if there's a, a reduction in the, uh, there's, a, trans, there's a, a change, for example, from gasoline to electric vehicles on the part of consumers, that will see a reduction in consumers' emissions, but that will count as a reduction in Occidental scope three emissions, General Motors scope three emissions, Dunlop scope three emissions, steel producers scope three emissions, and so on. So there'll be multiple counting, not just double counting, but triple, quadruple uh, counting in a case like this. Um, <clears throat> so the point about this is that if we sum all proposed reductions in all scopes by all companies, then we'll double count many reductions and triple or quadruple count many reductions, and we'll get a massive overestimate of the likely drop in emissions. Here's a little bit of data on uh, uh, the various types of scopes of emissions here. Um, so these are the uh, total emissions, the scope one emissions, scope two emissions, and scope three emissions of the companies that we've processed so far in the S&P 500, which is most of the big companies in the S&P 500, but not all of them. And uh, you'll see that um, scope two emissions are the smallest, and scope one emissions are the same next, and scope three emissions are by far the largest. Scope three emissions constitute about two thirds of the total. Scope one emissions constitute about one third of the total and so on. And this total emission is here. So this is the equivalent figure for the US as a whole. So they're in the, if you add up all of their emissions uh, that they pledged to reduce, including the scope one, scope two and scope three and make no allowance whatsoever for double counting, then the number comes to roughly half of US emissions. Um, <clears throat> But of course, there's a huge amount of double counting in there. And if you allow for the double counting, I suspect this will come down by quite a large factor. Here's the data for individual companies. Um, for the American Airlines, for example, the biggest source of emissions is scope one. And that's obviously not surprising. They, make, they, they do their business by burning jet fuel in aircraft. And so that for them, scope one is bigger than, much bigger than scope two and is also bigger than scope three. Here's Exxon, exactly the opposite is true. Uh, for Exxon, obviously, scope three is the dominant source of emissions. There's some emissions associated with their operations, but the principal source of emissions for Exxon is the combustion of their, of their, their uh, gasoline and, and other associated products by people like American Airlines, but by also, also by internal combustion engines and vehicles. Um, slightly surprisingly, if we look at people like Alphabet, uh, then the you know, Alphabet's direct emissions are just 64,000. Uh, 64, um, whereas the uh, indirect emissions are much, much bigger. Uh, the scope three emissions are what totally dominate Alphabet's emissions. Um, same is true for Amazon, although Amazon does have bigger scope one emissions, obviously because of the massive transportation issues associated with Amazon. And again, IBM uh, dominated by scope three emissions. Now remember, scope three emissions are almost certainly um, dominated by double counting. Uh, so the uh, so the, the, you know, the, these, these figures in the right-hand columns here are, are somewhat misleading. The, the ones really to focus on are these here, plus some fraction of these. So how do we avoid double counting? Uh, difficult. Uh, the key, th key thing to do here is to sum up scope one emissions. Scope one emissions are the emissions that firms can control directly, uh, where there's certainly no overlap. Um, don't include scope two emissions, because scope two emissions are obviously scope one emissions for power producers. Don't include most scope three, because most scope three is also scope one for somebody else. So there's double counting there. But do include the parts of scope three emissions arising from use by end consumers, i.e. by consumers or the government. Uh, 
and we estimate the uh, fraction of scope three emissions uh, generated by consumers within government by looking at the fraction of total output of the sector going to these categories. We can get that from uh, what economists call an input output table. Okay, so that's the way in which we're proceeding to try to avoid double counting. And as I said, we haven't finished that pr process yet, but it's clear that it, produce, it reduces total emissions to something much closer to the sum of scope one than it is to the sum of all of these things. Now, let me just talk a little bit about this concept of carbon neutral versus carbon zero. Um, <clears throat> a lot of companies, and indeed countries too, as we heard from David and Matt just now, are pledging to be carbon neutral by mid-century. So what does carbon neutral mean? It means that carbon emissions minus carbon sinks equals the number of carbon offsets purchased. So a car company emits carbon, it may possibly take in carbon as well, as we heard from Occidental, for example, Occidental is planning to capture carbon. Most companies don't capture carbon, but, but some may involve, be involved in carbon capture. So carbon emissions minus carbon sinks, i.e. carbon captured, is equal to carbon offsets purchased. That's what we mean by carbon neutral. So if, there's no, if, you, if you don't manage, run any carbon sinks, as most companies don't, it means that carbon emissions are equal to carbon offsets purchased. So you're offsetting your emissions. That's being carbon neutral. The alternative is to be carbon zero or to be net zero, uh, which means that carbon emissions minus carbon sinks equals zero, no offsets purchased. You don't offset anything, but you remove your CO2 emissions totally. Okay, so that's the difference between uh, carbon neutral uh, and carbon zero or net zero. Carbon neutral involves using offsets, uh, being carbon zero or net zero doesn't. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the implications of using offsets. Suppose the world consists of two countries, A and B, and each produces 100 units of emissions every year. Okay, so you have a very simple world, two countries, A and B, each producing 100 units of emissions. So A produce, persuades B to reduce emissions to zero and to sell it title to the, op, to the reduction. So country A turns to country B and says, we want you to reduce your emissions to zero and we'll pay you to do that. And in exchange for that payment, we want you to give us title to that reduction. So A is buying an offset from B. So suppose this happens, B reduces its emissions to zero and then sells the title to that to A for some agreed sum of money. As a result of that transaction, A is carbon neutral. So country A is carbon neutral and country B is carbon zero. So it sounds like a good outcome, right? We've got a world of two countries. One is carbon neutral, one is carbon zero. Actually, the world as a whole is neither. The world as a whole is still producing 100 units of carbon uh, and it's not being offset in any way, okay? So there is a problem with offsets. Offsets don't add up, okay? Um, the IPCC gives us conditions for meeting the two degree centigrade target. The world has to be carbon zero by mid-century. You can't get to being carbon zero by mid-century by being, being carbon neutral by mid-century. The world as a whole cannot be carbon neutral. Uh, for the world as a whole to be carbon neutral, we'd have to be buying offsets from somebody else, someone on front, like people on Mars or people on Venus or something like that. So obviously the world as a whole cannot be carbon neutral. The world as a whole is either carbon positive or carbon zero. So does this mean there's no role at all for offsets? So let's talk about offsets in a bit more detail. As I sort of indicated right now, an offset is a situation where you reduce your emissions and you allow me to claim the reduction as mine in exchange for a payment. So there is in principle a reduction. And this can make sense for entities who want to claim reductions and have a very high marginal cost of abatement, a marginal cost of reducing their emissions. And the classic example of that at the moment is airlines. Airlines are under a lot of pressure to reduce their emissions, uh, but for them to reduce emissions by reducing the combustion of fossil fuels is actually very difficult and very expensive. They face a very high, what economists call marginal abatement cost. So it may make sense for the airlines to pay somebody else to reduce emissions and then claim that emission is that, that reduction is theirs. So um, here's an example of how offsets can possibly help. Sorry. Again, we've got a very simple uh, model, two countries, country A and country B. <clears throat> Let's suppose that country A is willing to pay $50 to abate carbon emissions, $50 a ton to abate carbon emissions. But the cost of the marginal cost of abatement in country A is $60. So country A won't abate because it's willing to pay $50 to cut back emissions, but it costs $60, so it won't abate on its own. 
Country B, the numbers are similar, but, uh, but lower. <clears throat> Country B is willing to pay $40 to reduce emissions by one ton, but the actual cost of reduction is $50. So again, Country B on its own won't abate. Okay, in each country, the cost of abatement is more than the people in that country are willing to pay for abatement. However, the cost of abatement in B is $50. In A, people are willing to pay $50. So if we open up an offset market between the two countries, people in country A can pay people in country B $50 in order to reduce emissions. So the creation of an offset market actually leads to abatement that wouldn't otherwise have happened in this case. So there can be a role for an offset market in a context like this. However, offsets have to have a high level of integrity. It means offsets have to be at least country-based and not project-based. And for example, and then the, what do I mean by this? Suppose that I in my country persuade you in your country to plant trees to remove carbon. And then I claim the offset. And this is something which is happening very commonly and very often. You know? uh, many, many entities in the US are persuading uh, entities in other countries, typically developing countries, to plant trees which will absorb CO2. And then the CO2 which is absorbed is being claimed by the entity in the US as a reduction in its emissions. Um, suppose this happens and then somebody in your country goes and cuts down a forest or releases chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere or builds a coal-fired power station or you, know, you can complete the list of things and millions of things could happen. Um, then clearly there's actually no real reduction in emissions. So at a minimum, if I'm going to create an off, I'm going to purchase an offset by say, having somebody in another country plant trees, um, I need to, need to deal with a country that has an auditable carbon accounting system at the national level, and a country that can verify that there actually has been a reduction in total annual emissions because of the activity that I've carried out. And that a reduction in, and, 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 and the reduction in emissions wasn't immediately offset and negated by some other intervention elsewhere in the country. So this means that rather than buying offsets generated by particular projects, which are local to a specific region of a particular country, you have to buy offsets from the country itself. And you have to make certain that the country itself has an auditable carbon accounting system. Now the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the IPCC have both set out standards for national carbon accounting. And some countries already have national carbon accounts, carbon accounts that meet these standards. And some of these countries are taking part in the system called Red Plus. For example, Papua New Guinea has a carbon accounting system which meets the UNFCCC standards and has recently actually started selling offsets based on that standard. Um, as I said, this means buying offsets from countries, not projects. And most offsets traded today, unfortunately, are project based and are quite likely worthless. Uh, even if offsets are country based, there may still be leakages to set against an offset. For example, Papua New Guinea may reduce emissions from deforestation, but it may cause deforestation, deforestation to increase in immediately adjacent parts of Indonesia. Uh, that would not be captured by, by a national accounting system. That would only be captured by a, a regional accounting system that goes beyond the country. Um, so there are, there are limitations, even if we have proper national-based accounting systems, but they're certainly better than project-based accounting systems. We could, of course, discount offsets to allow for leakage if we think this is significant, and that's an empirical question. This is actually a, an advert for um, offsets generated by Papua New Guinea in this particular case. Um, uh, these are offsets being managed by a thing called the Coalition for Rainforest Nations, which is actually run by two Columbia Business School alumni, Kevin Conrad and Fede Vieta. Uh, and as I said, they recently started selling offsets uh, that are generated that meet the UNFCCC standards. So summarizing, um, the world as a whole can't be carbon neutral. It can only be carbon zero or carbon positive. We need it to be carbon zero. So ultimately there's no room for offsets, but given sufficient accounting integrity, we can get, they can help on the way there, but currently that integrity is a bit scarce. Thank you very much.